So at this point, I'd like to ask you to mute your microphones, send questions to us by the chat box at any time during the program, and then we will answer questions from viewers at that at the end. And I hope enter into a lively discussion about the various aspects, aspects of patina and the material covered today. I'm very happy today that to welcome two, uh, two special guests, Dr. Stephen Tate and Dr. Susan Tate. Uh, and together they will be presenting the program on patina too, oops. Both of them have hold PhDs from the University of Wisconsin. And uh, Steve has a bachelor's degree in chemistry, another degree in chemical engineering and uh, material engineering. Together, they own a consulting company, pair of docs, professionals in Madison, Wisconsin. And they specialize in different aspects of corrosion on metals, stones, and minerals. Now, the subject of patina on stones is important in viewing stone appreciation practices. A stone should have an aged appearance, suggesting the feeling of elegance steeped in history. The expression of oldness comes largely from the surface appearance of the stone, its patina. Now, we learned from the part one, the first one that program we had in January, that patina is, are more complex than first thought. There are different types of patina, and they're ones that are naturally occurring, as well as artificially induced patina. Well, today we're going to continue the study of this complex issue and, and look at some of the stones that they've collected, that uh, other people have collected. For example, this is a stone from the desert areas of Southern California. And I picked up stones like this before over many years. And I've noticed they've had a hard coating or shell around it. And I've always wondered what this is. Well, today we're going to find out. So with this, I'm going to turn the program over to uh, Steve and let him pick up and run with it from here. <clears throat> well, thank you, Tom. And uh, hello to everybody. Um, from Sue and myself, we got to let Zoom go through its uh, stages here. Uh, here we go. I assume that has showed up. <clears throat> We're going to start off with a uh, just a review on the definition of patina. This was developed uh, with input from Asana members and integrated with science. Uh, patina is a stable coating on your viewing stone surface and its chemistry and crystallography are different from the base stone. Incidentally, I'm gonna follow the Vasana convention of switching back and forth between rock and stone uh, so if I say rock, I mean stone. If I say stone, I mean rock. Today, we're going to cover a number of topics. Going to just do a quick review of patina science part one. And then we'll go into patina science part two, where we'll talk about the science, the scientific terms, cover four examples of actual uh, Rhine patinas. And then a topic that I hope you'll find interesting is uh, viewing stone Ryan patinas, not just a pretty face. And then we'll finish up with some six seminar takeaways and the closing remarks. Well, in part one, which is available on YouTube, we talked about three of the four patinas. We talked about the oxalate patina. This is a really nice example shown here, rare example. This is marble uh, statuary. You can see the patina up here and then the base stone down here. The metal oxalate, process, oxalate patina actually destroys stone in order to form. So this, what we see as patina here was originally stone. 
There's also a what's referred to as a desert varnish patina. This is, as you can see, it's a sedimentary or a depository. It's many layers, uh, each deposited at different wet dry seasons. And uh, it kind of looks like tree rings, or if you will, a miniature uh, Grand Canyon. These two are on the order of 20,000 years old, uh, the best guess. We also talked about artisanal patinas. Uh, this is an example from our collection. It's a, uh, that we bought it from a state, I think it's about 125 years old. We believe this is sculpted uh, for the base stone. And interestingly enough, uh, Hiromi pointed out that this lighter base here with the darker top is typical of the Japanese Edo period. As part of the patina science part one, we pointed out that the research that's going on on patinas really encompasses a wide variety of art, engineering, and scientific disciplines. As a matter of fact, it's, it's almost A to Z, archeology span to water science. Different types of viewing stones develop different types of patinas in different environments. Lots of difference, but basically the kind of patina you get depends on the stone and the environment. Patina chemistry and how patinas are formed are different for different types of patinas. We just saw that uh, in the slide before uh, the last slide. Patinas can be a single layer or multiple layers of different materials. Again, it depends on type of stone and its environment. Patinas develop over long periods of time. They can also be eroded from stone surfaces. Uh, for a while, there was a lot of excitement over desert varnishes because they said, oh, this, this is like a tree ring. We can count the rings and we can know how old this uh, uh, patina is. Well, uh, unfortunately, erosion does remove layers uh, from time to time. So it makes dating, using it as dating very difficult. Um, artisanal patinas, uh, has been around the globe for millennia, and viewing stone re patina research is ongoing. Patina Science 1 and patina, today's Patina Science Part 2 is currently state-of-the-art based on a lot of publications and books. However, in 10 years, I hope that it's different. I hope because the research brings in uh, more knowledge about this and increases our understanding, maybe even changes uh, our theories. There's a link here to the Patina Science Part 1 on YouTube. We're also going to have a slide at the end with some references. So let's start talking about uh, continuing with Patina Science uh, Part 2. Going to start with scientific terms and science relevant to rind patinas. That's the fourth patina that we didn't discuss the last, last time. Start off with processes and forces that determine viewing stone and rind patina structure, shape, texture, and chemistry. So we'll talk about erosion, tumbling, force, and transformation. And what are the cave-like features and holes that you find in your viewing stones? We talked about uh, erosion in part one, wind with or without abrasives, like sand, uh, flowing water with or without abrasives. The kind of shape you get and the kind of texture you get is dependent upon if it's hard or soft, the stone is hard or soft. This is a uh, Alaskan black jade specimen in our collection. Notice that this is a hard stone. Notice that your, your edges are smooth. And in some cases, it is even taking on a polish. This does have a patina on it, but the water flowing over this particular stone is uh, removing it as it grows back. Softer stones, you get much uh, sharper features and undercuts and a more coarse uh, finish on that. Tumbling, another kind of erosion. Uh, it can be over ground or under the water bouncing along the stream bed. Tumbling, typically you get a little smoother surface. This is a piece of granite. 
uh, and it's usually, you know, the oval or kind of roundish shape. So let's build on those two and let's talk about force. Force is a little more complex, but it does transform, view, transform viewing stone chemistry and structure. It also shapes and textures viewing stone. Force is kind of an oblique concept. It's the amount of energy per area. The terms can, there's a number of terms. I'm gonna use pounds per square inch. There's also megapascals uh, per square inch. PSI is the abbreviation for pounds per square inch. Two types of forces, pressure and stress. Pressure is compressive as, and stress is complex. It can be compressive shear and tensile in a combination of these different kinds of uh, pressures. Pressure at high temperature can also change viewing stone chemistry and structure. Probably the most well-known example of that is limestone where it's a layered structure. As you can see here, you add uh, high pressure and high temperature to that and you get a crystalline structure now, which is marble. Both of the calcium carbonate, but one's layered, the other's crystalline. One of the, there's actually two transformative processes that occur because of pressure uh, and temperature. Uh, one is metamorphic and the other is metasomatic. Metamorphic is the, most people are, have heard this term or know, uh, what this term is. Uh, up until a few decades ago, every transformation of stone was metamorphic. But more recently, we're talking about another process or a subprocess called metasomatic. Metamorphic is a solid rock reaction. For example, albite can decompose to form jade and silica. Metasomatic is rock reacting with gas and or liquid. It could be both. Some differences between those two, when you're talking metamorphic, temperatures are on the range of 200 degrees centigrade to 1300 degrees centigrade. This is where most of your rocks uh, and minerals will start to melt. To give you a reference, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade. So this is a very hot process. It also involves some very high pressures, starting around 43,000 PSI. In the ultra high pressure things, you talk about a half a million PSI. Again, PSI is pounds per square inch. Metasomatic processes occur at lower temperatures because now you have gas and liquid to, shall we say, soften things up. And so they range from around 100 degrees C or less to less than the melting point of the rocks and minerals. It's a new area. We don't really know what the minimum pressure is at this point. A lot of research going on. Uh, two examples, the one on the left is your metamorphic, the one on the right is your metasomatic, two entirely different looking viewing stones. Let's move on to stress. Pressure creates stress inside a stone. Pressures or stress is more complex. It can be compressive, shear and tensile, or some very wild combinations of both. If you take a viewing stone, that's this in this case, I just chose an elliptical shape, and you pull on it in opposite directions, you have a tensile stress. If you take your hand and you push on the top of it or the sides or whatever in opposite direction, each hand moves in opposite directions, you now have a shear stress. And those two produce the lines. And of course, now you can see a distorted shape here, plus some lines through it. Let's look at an actual example. This is a Lingby viewing stone. This thing's 25 inches high. My best guess is it weighs uh, somewhere around 90 pounds or so because I can just barely pick it up. Uh, we had to hire some movers to actually lift it up and put it on the stand because uh, just beyond my ability to lift that kind of weight. 
Um, notice the lines in it. Some are going here, you've got a group of parallel lines, but now here down, you've got lines going perpendicular to that, and it looks like even lines going in circular direction. If we look from the top of this piece downward, you can see that it's kind of terraced. You can also see that the, the lines created by the stress go into the patina itself, or excuse me, yeah, yeah the patina, this is, a, a very thick rind patina is on it. These lines now are gonna direct the flow of water and air over it to create further erosion and accentuate them. So stress produces these lines and cracks that create viewing stone texture and veins. When you have cracks, they can fill in with secondary materials. Um, we were talking about that uh, green schist earlier that had some calcite uh, inclusions in it basically stress probably cracked it and then the calcite came along and filled it in. What are the cave-like features and holes that you find in viewing stones? I wondered about that for a long time and they're, they're called tophony. They're cave-like features and holes with smooth walls and openings. Tophone, tophony, the words uh, probably stem from Corsican words tophony, for windows or tofanari for perforations. There's also a close, close word in Greek, but it's a word for sepulcher. And I tend to think of this uh, as being more cave-like. Um, as you can see the smooth walls, and this does look like the opening of a, of a cave. This is another uh, viewing stone. Both of these are from uh, Huntington Gardens, Chinese garden, uh, Huntington, Huntington, uh, or, uh, Oh, I'm losing the name of the city here. Uh, we'll say Huntington, California, but that's uh, not correct. Here's you got the examples of the Tifoni. This rock is an assembled rock. Um, and I look at this and I say, eh, they probably drilled a hole in this to make it look pretty. Um, this is a smaller uh, viewing stone sample. This is sandstone. Uh, and you can see multiple tophone, tophone, excuse me, all throughout and over the stone. As I say, tophone is a relative new, new concept. We're not sure what causes them. So when you're not sure, you kind of say it's everything. And so we call it a complex interaction between chemical weathering, stress, and erosion. Pasadena, California. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Let's talk about viewing stone birthplaces and um, how that affects what kind of patina you're gonna get. Most of us are familiar with sediment deposits, uh, limestone and dolomite and sandstone, but viewing stones can also be generated by tectonic processes. Uh, where you have magma that doesn't reach the surface. Uh, magma is, by definition, it's molten and solid rock with water and gases. Uh, volcanoes, which is where the viewing stone that Tom uh, showed earlier, uh, this is now where uh, coming from volcanoes, mid-ocean mid ridges and so on, but this has where you have lava being either ejected from a volcano or breaking to the surface. Difference between lava and magma is uh, lava is molten and solid rock plus water. Gases don't stick around. There's also subduction. And I'm gonna divine, define subduction in the next slide. It's a complex process. I'm gonna have to do it with a diagram. Subduction creates your orogenic belts or your mountain ranges and it creates ophiolites, ophiolites, excuse me. And I can't define ophiolites until I talk about subduction, but I've got two examples here of viewing stones that originated from ophiolites. So let's talk about subduction. In the middle of the oceans, you get these ridges uh, where you get a crack in the crust, the ocean crust, and you're getting 
magma coming up as it spills out becomes lava because the gases escape and rolls down along here. Now, because of these ridges, and these ridges extend for thousands of miles, and of course, they're uh, thousands of feet below the surface of water. But when you get to uh, Iceland, the ridge, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Ridge, actually emerges on land. And Sue and I are hoping to go to uh, Iceland next year and actually stand by it or on it, or Tom said I should straddle it with my feet and see if uh, uh, it uh, starts to spread my feet uh, further and further apart. Well, what's happening at these mid-ocean ridges is the seafloor now is spreading. And it's spreading in both directions and it's spreading towards the continent. It's moving very slowly based on these numbers here somewhere, and these are approximations, 20 million to 108 million from the time it's created here to the time where the, the seabed slams or the ocean uh, crust slams into the continent. When that, when the two, when the ocean crust slams into the continental crust, it subducts, it's dragged underneath the surface. Well, when you're bringing a lot of material in like this, yet something has to happen up here and it pushes things up here to create your mountain ranges. You're also sucking in a lot of seawater as this is subducting. One feature here I wanna point out is what they call the Beanoff Wadadi zone. Down here in the subduction area, the sub subduction zone, you get a very high earthquake frequency that contributes to uh, the formation of the mountain ranges. We're talking about the upper mantle here on the order of 720 kilometers and 432 miles. So now we can start to try and define ophiolites. Remember, we were just talking about how tectonic forces and volcanism push the underfloor, uh, push the ocean floor at the mid ocean ridge, ridges and ancient, ancient oceans like the Tethys towards continents. Well, ophiolites are slabs of moving ocean crust that break off when the tectonic fo forces push the ocean crust under the continental crust during the subduction process. So let's return to that slide. I've modified this a little bit. Uh, I've got an oval shaped checkered symbol here uh, to designate ophiolites. The reason I do that is to remind myself that the crust here that's arriving is not just the lava from the mid-ocean ridge, it's also all the sediment that rains down on it as it travels on its 20 million to 108 million uh, year travel. So this is somewhat brittle, it's cold. When it slams into the continental crust, it's in the lithosphere, which is warmer, but because it's brittle, it cracks. You get these you know, pieces of it cracking. Some of them are gonna, the pieces will continue down and, and eventually dissolve and be recycled. Basically, this whole subduction process is recycling the, the ocean crust. But some of these things will rise. They're less dense than the upper mantle material. There's surface tension differences. And you have these earthquakes going on shaking this material, the, or shake, shaking the material in the upper mantle. Now, we think of, Earth as being terraforma, <clears throat> and we think of the crust in the mantle, the upper mantle as being solid. Well, the upper mantle is not. The upper mantle is like a, a bowl of oatmeal. When you look at it, it looks solid, but if you take a spoon and, and start swirling it around or a straw or a stick or something, um, it moves because it's a combination of water and solids. Matter of fact, if you put raisins in it, now you have a model for ophiolites moving through 
the upper mantle. And they, as they move through, I've tried to illustrate here, they, with these, uh, the brown dotted line here, the ophelites will get pieces of the upper mantle sticking to them. They will reach uh, just underneath the uh, crust along the, all along the, the uh, mountain range and erosion in some instances exposes them. However, there are also some of these ophiolites continue to be pushed up. As a matter of fact, the ophiolite, there's a very large one. It's uh, about 20 miles uh, long axis and about eight miles in diameter in New Idria, um, California. It's in the Southern uh, San Benito County of California. That ophiolite, when they look at satellite photos of it, is actually still being pushed out of the ground. I was telling Sue this morning, I'd love to go one of our trips out uh, to Los Angeles. I'd love to go to New Idria and stand on top of uh, the New Idria ophiolite because it's still moving and just be able to say that I stood on it. This is a picture <clears throat> of an ophiolite in uh, Liguria, Italy. This was taken by Tom. This is one of the coolest pictures of an ophiolite I have ever seen. Uh, you can see the kind of oval sausage shape, lens shape of the ophiolite, or in this case, uh, almost circular. Uh, most pictures of ophiolites, when you see them, it's just a, a pile of broken stone. Uh, not very pretty, but this, this is really cool. And from this uh, ophiolite, here's the viewing stone that was collected by Tom at that. So mountain ranges are just filled with ophiolites and ophiolites mixed with fragments of crust and mantle, which are called melanges. And this is a, a, a world diagram uh, that uh, Robert Coleman put in his book, Ophiolites. Uh, he kind of, uh, Robert set the template for how to analyze these and characterize these. They'd been around for a long time, but he kind of pioneered how, how it should be done. Um, <clears throat> those of you who live in California, you can see why uh, when you go to Eel River uh, in Trinity County, California, or the Yuha Desert, uh, you're finding all kinds of really cool uh, viewing stones. Those of you who live in Canada, uh, tons of ophiolites, you know, hundreds and hundreds of ophiolites. Uh, Japan, uh, Korea, China, of course, is really worldwide. Uh, it's a very common phenomenon. The reason geologists are so, uh, there's so much work being done on it. Oh, and I forgot to measure one of my, uh, mention one of my favorite places, Italy. Uh, this is where the Ligurian uh, viewing stone that we just showed you uh, was found by Tom. Um, one of the reasons that geologists are so uh, spending so much time researching ophiolites is because it's a time capsule. You're looking at pieces of an ancient seabed that could be at least 100 million years old or even older. Different ophiolites, different stones, different rinds. Here's an example of a jade. Uh, viewing stone. It uh, was found in Trinity Cali County, California, the Eel River Bear Creek confluence, where a lot of, I see a lot of uh, viewing stones coming out of uh, the Eel River. Uh, this is another one. It's a blue Kataro stone um, from central Hokkaido Mountains in Japan. Japan is just dotted with lights. Uh, this particular one is actually uh, part of the melange. It's uh, uh, because of its blue color, blue-gray color, it's stonite, hartsbergite, or lerzolite. And then uh, you just saw this one, the marl dolomite from southeast Liguria in Italy. Different ophiolites, different stone, viewing stones, different rinds. 
most of your silicate stones are typically found with Rhine patinas, uh, silicates being basalt, jade, jasper, serpentine, and so on. Uh, this is a large piece in our mineral collection. It's uh, a last on the one on the left. There we go. Uh, it's it's I believe it's nephrite based on the um, texture of the stone, but I haven't done a spectral analysis, so I just have to give you my best guess at this point. Notice that it's covered with a dark gray uh, rind. You can see the, the edge of the rind along here. If you found this on the ground, uh, you didn't know what you're looking for. Uh, the person who found this that I bought it from knew they were looking for jade. Uh, you would have looked at this and said, well, that's ugly. I'm not gonna pick that up. Uh, Labradorite, this is the um, rind on Labradorite. I tried to show the other side with, along with the rind, wasn't able to, but on the other side, it's been polished and has a beautiful uh, colors, iridescent colors of gold, blue, green. Uh, again, though, if you saw this on the ground, um, from this side, you'd say, well, that's just another ugly stone, although it's got some characteristic Labradorite features. Uh, amethyst, this is another one in our collection. These are all uh, large specimens. I think this one's, I'm looking at it, it's about, it's at least 25 inches. But this has the iron rind patina on it. Um, not very pretty, but look at the, there's a gorgeous viewing stone on the inside. So let's continue on. We'll talk about how Rhine patinas grow and form. I'll compare the different, the four different types of patinas, talk about some of the scientific research that's going on, and then finish up with four examples of actually uh, patinas. Well, Rhine patinas are formed one of two ways, chemical weathering, or bioassisted oh. uh, chemical weathering. It can be in air, under the soil, under water, buried in soil and bed stream beds. Um, uh, just to define a term, saprolite is a fancy word for rock, rock rotting. <laughs> That's, uh, The chemical reactions uh, for chemical weathering between the stone minerals, water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water, in some instances, pollution. The thing about rinds and rind or rind patinas is they're replacing the stone. Indeed, the process of rind formation is converting a stone to soil. Now, those of you that have viewing stones with beautiful rind patinas on them, don't worry. We're talking about growth rates on a geological time scale that's on the order of greater than 50 million years. So it's a very, very slow rate. It's not gonna, dis it's not gonna become soil in your lifetime. General growth model, this I put together uh, based on the most current belief as to how uh, rind patinas grow. Start with uh, when the stone is first exposed to the weathering environment, time increasing on the right side here. Here's the unweathered stone. As time goes on, it forms a rind and the stone gets smaller. Now, the rind also erodes. So you get your, you won't find your stone with the rind being the same size as the original stone. And as time goes on, it gets smaller and smaller until now it's soil. This is a uh, enlargement of the model. Um, here you have on the outside area, this is where the air would be, the atmosphere would be, or water. Uh, this is your rind here, and this is the base stone. These squiggly lines, uh, of two different colors are cracks in the rind that allow atmospheric water or water 
to enter into uh, the rind and reach the stone to cause it to dissolve and form a rind. The reason I did two colors on these squiggly lines is out here, outside the rind is an oxygen rich environment. So the pH of the water that gets into these cracks and moves through the cracks at this point is alkaline. However, when you get down to where the stone is, you're in an oxygen poor environment. And now you're talking about an acidic uh, solution and that acidic solution will surround the stone. And of course, that's what's causing it to dissolve and subsequently form the rind. Um, give me examples. Oxygen in the air is about 19.6%. Uh, the oxygen concentration down here would be around six parts per million. It's that big of a drop. Rinds can also have multiple layers. This is a New Zealand nephrite. Uh, this is a very old rind. It's about 6.3 centimeters thick. So it's a very old rind. Uh, they show the first layer is the unweathered stone, and then the tenth layer uh, is uh, at the surface is a is a brown colored uh, patina. A rind patina is different from other patinas. Uh, yes and no. Um, and I actually modified this from uh, this slide a little bit from last night's uh, presentation. We're talking about Ryan patinas today. Patina Science One talked about the metal oxalate, desert varnish, and artisanal. Both the rind and metal oxalate patinas are part of the process of decomposing the stone. Uh, the rind, we're converting it to soil metal oxalate organic acids from a biofilm are dissolving the stone, but the patina will slow it down, whereas desert varnish in the artisanal processes or patinas uh, are not causing any stone decomposition. There's two types of weathering, chemical and bio-assisted chemical. As you can see uh, with the rind patina, it could be both. Metal oxalate, it's bio-assisted desert varnish, again, could be both. And artisanal is entirely different. It's just, uh, we're putting material on the viewing stone to darken it, and so it's chemical absorption. Time scale, geological. Uh, we had a question last night uh, that I stumbled on. I couldn't answer it. They said, well, what, what is geological time? It's a really good question. Uh, it's a key question. And I looked it up in the definition. Basically, the definition says it's arbitrary. So Sue and I had a lively discussion this morning, as we were talking about earlier, and we decided we'd use the age of the Grand Canyon as just kind of a um, metric for what geological time is. It's greater than 50 million years. Uh, but they can range from metal oxalate around 100 years to one to two years for artisanal. Do rinds fit our patina definition? Patina is a stable coating on a viewing stone surface. Well, we are looking at coatings, aren't we? Here's the stone and there's its coating with the nephrite. Basalt, here's the stone and here's its rind patina, which is a coating. And of course the model based on a lot of different publications. Uh, it's a composite uh, is a coating also. And the chemistry is different from the base stone. So let's talk about what research is going on with Ryan Patinas. If you start at the top, you see kind of a laundry list of different stones that have been studied, jade, serpentines, basalts, feldspars, tough, which is a lithified volcanic ash, obsidian schists. Uh, we saw the, you know, uh, we were talking about green schists before the program began, shale and slate. We're going to restrict our discussion to uh, jade, serpentine, and basalt. So let's talk about jade. Jade refers to either the mineral jadeite or the rock nephrite. 
whoa, some of you are saying, hold on, I thought nephrite was a mineral. Well, the International Mineralogical Society reclassified nephrite as a rock because nephrite's actually a mixture, a mineral mixture, ranging from tremolite to ferroactinolite. If you're interested in chemistry, there's their chemistry. Whereas jade's a mineral because it's a single compound. And if you're interested in its chemistry, that's there. There's also jada, jada tight rock, which is 90% jade. Again, rock and stone are being used interchangeably now. So we got a mineral and a rock are both referred to as jade. And we're gonna talk about their rind separately. After the Patina Science uh, One seminar, Frank Kelly sent uh, some pictures to me of his, uh, one of his favorite uh, viewing, mountain viewing stones. Uh, here it is on the, its diaza. Um, and it's just, you know, really cool colors. You get a slight green, but you get tones, uh, you know, browns and reds and golds and so on. When you take it off the stand and look at the bottom, the rock is green. So Frank's question to me is, Steve, what makes my green rock brown? Well, it's the patina. And there's some interesting science behind this. Um, a lot of people think that the, the jade mineral is oxidizing. Uh, but it's not. It's not directly, uh, you're not forming the rind directly from oxidation because the iron and the aluminum both in the uh, crystal structure of the mineral are at their highest oxidation state. Well, the jadeite reacts with water and our carbon dioxide and water to form a complex mixture of patina rind minerals like limonite, gertite, siderite, baymite, gypsite, all things that can react with water, carbon dioxide in this mineral here. I'm gonna uh, move on to nephrite before summarizing uh, rind mineral colors because nephrite forms a lot of the same uh, rind minerals. Um, you saw this example earlier. I've added the, the full figure here as the uh, authors of this research refer to this as the bleach zone because you're still in the white to pale green color. And they refer to this as the oxidized zone um, because of the, the brown colors. And in other words, what they're saying is the oxidation doesn't occur here. Well, I'm not getting my pointer, but it's not occurring at the unweathered rock surface. It's occurring out here in the upper layers or the outer layers of the patina. They hypothesized, and it makes a lot of sense, that uh, the layers are formed because of wet dry cycles, climate changes, and variations in nephrite mineral chemistry. And as I said, the oxidation is not occurring. The stone's not directly oxidizing. Uh, the oxidation occurs to give you the brown later on to give you the brown color. Here's a summary of jade, rind, patina, mineral colors. We're talking again about both jadeite and nephrite. You can see from the rind minerals, you're going from lim limonite and gertite. Those two are analogs. They're both an iron oxide, hydroxide. Gypsite, baymite are aluminum compounds. Siderite is an iron carbonate. What color do you want your rind to be? <laughs> Just looking at limonite, it can be light brown to brown to even a yellowish brown. You go to gertite, and I've got a beautiful uh, example of uh, gertite, which is, uh, you know, in this black, but it can also be yellow brown, reddish brown. You get into your aluminums, bluish, uh, green, white, gray. Um, and it all depends on what kind of contamination you have in the rind materials as to what color you're gonna get. But this, uh, this slide kind of, when you're looking at the different uh, minerals here, 
you begin to realize that to try and uh, say, oh, a certain rock is this material because it's this color, uh, you, you're running the risk of, of mischaracterizing mis the rock because different the same mineral can give you a lot of different colors. Let's move on to serpentine. Serpentine is short for serpentine group. Uh, the serpentine group has three different kinds of minerals, chrysotile, antigorite, and lizardite. Serpentinite is a rock where you have greater than 90% of one or more of the serpentine minerals. Serpentine will react with uh, carbon dioxide and water to form limestone dolo or dolomite and silica. And this is called marl or marley limestone. Serpentine can also react with water to form J. And there's a lot of work going on with ophiolites uh, in the serpentine that's in ophiolites to the uh, creates the jade in little nodules. Um, serpentine serpentinites are usually found in ophiolites. Uh, very common to find them there. Serpentine rind minerals, there's a lot of commonality with the jade rinds. So you'll see uh, the list uh, has many of the same ones that we've already talked about, but we're also adding now limestone, which gives you your white or beige or cream color, dolomite, gray, tan, white, pink, yellowish to brown, almost what color do you want, uh, and silica, which was your opaque to light yellow. Talk about basalt. Basalt is a fine grained rock formed from lava. It, it consists of two essential minerals. If it doesn't have a northite, at greater than 50% in augite or augite, as some people say, then it's not a basalt, it's something else. This is the, uh, again, for those of you that want to see the chemistry, there's the chemistry of those. But basalt can also have what they call accessory minerals like chromite, magnetite, apatite, ilmenite, which is a titanium compound. They can also have large crystals that you can see with the unaided eye of other minerals. These are called phenocrysts, such as olivine. Um, I suspect that several of you probably have a basalt sample uh, that has a clump or a cluster of little green uh, crystals on it or buried, embedded in it. These are phenocrysts, and they're probably phenocrysts of olivine or peridot. Basalt chemistry varies widely with geographical location. You, it, it still has to have the two essential minerals, the northite and ogite, but uh, beyond that, it can have all kinds of different things in it. Tom showed this to you in his introduction. This is found, as he said, the Uhaw, Des Uhaw Desert. Uh, it's basalt with a rind patina. This is a, a closer uh, and large picture of what he showed. Notice that it's, it's a very old rind. This is about a half inch thick. Um, and it has kind of what I refer to as a pie crust look or texture to it, a little more fluffy. Here's your basalt core. Uh, I suspect this broke at one point, and you can see the rind is actually reforming. If you look at the shape of this, it's kind of round. I suspect that what you're looking at here is a lava bomb, an ancient volcano that was full of gas and, and liquid and so on that when it erupted, it exploded. And these pieces just blew out of it all over the place. One of the things, the lava bonds, bonds are one of the main things that make volcanoes so dangerous. Uh, so um, the major rind minerals uh, that you find are 
gibsonite and gertite again, but also now we're picking up kaolinite and that's what's giving us that fluffy kind of, or pie crust kind of look. You can also have a lot of different other minor rind minerals or accessory minerals, if you will, that vary by geographical location. This is just a summary of the colors, the gypsite and gertite you've seen several times. Um, kaolinite now has white to cream, pale yellow, hues of tans and browns. Well, hewing stone rind patinas are not just a pretty face. We all know that atmospheric carbon dioxide is increasing since the industrial uh, revolution. Indeed, it's increasing has been increasing exponentially since 1960. Indeed, in May of this year, there was 0.0421% carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, uh, which is about uh, is 421 parts per million. Carbon dioxide is considered toxic at around 5,000 parts per million. Well, based on ice, core drillings, uh, they estimate that around a half a million, half a billion, excuse me, to two and a half billion years ago, the carbon dioxide concentration on Earth was on the order of 10,000, excuse me, 10% of Earth's atmosphere or 100,000 parts per million. This is considered lethal. As a matter of fact, uh, the National Institute of Occupational safety classifies this as immediate death level. Uh, so at one time, uh, fauna like ourselves uh, were not able to live and breathe you know, on uh, planet Earth. The plants were happy. And of course, uh, sea creatures, are somewhat shielded so they could survive, <coughs> but certainly not us. Excuse me. So at some point, Earth decided to make itself habitable for us. And it's done that by sequestering the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There are actually three ways that it can do that. Plants, uh, the oceans and lakes where you have plants and organisms and rocks. And when I was in graduate school, um, we won't say how many decades ago this was, um, the big discovery was a number of researchers did a mass balance on carbon dioxide. They took the amount of plant coverage on planet Earth, the amount of people and the amount of fossil fuels that are burned, they did the balance and they said they had more carbon dioxide than what should have been that was actually there. And at that time, it dawned on everybody that the oceans were playing a part in this. Uh, today, we say, well, of course, uh, but back then it wasn't so obvious. In the last couple of decades, we realized that rocks have also played an important point. And my suspicion uh, is, is that back when the concentration was 10% or 100,000 parts per million, that all the volcanoes and earthquakes and so on that were going on and uh, basalt floods uh, were part of Earth's way of reducing the carbon dioxide. There is research going on where pilot sized facilities are uh, sequestering atmospheric carbon dioxide using serpentine beds and basalt beds. Basalt's uh, believed to be the most efficient at this point. So, you know, the carbon dioxide is still going up. Um, Earth regulates things. It's kind of like your thermostat for your heating and cooling. When the temperature drops or raises to a certain level, it will either turn heating on when it drops or turn the cooling on when it uh, gets too hot. Uh, Earth has a built-in feedback system, monitoring system like that. So the question is, what 
carbon dioxide level, will Earth turn the therm will the thermostat turn on the the mechanisms? Well, uh, right now we're we're in the process of we're cutting down our rainforests. Um, and we're burning them down, we're polluting our oceans, so we're, we're demanding more and more of the rocks. Uh, does that mean we're looking for um, we're looking forward to earthquakes sometime? Uh, probably not in our near future, uh, but stay tuned, I guess. Six takeaways from this uh, seminar. Uh, we've finished the discussion today with part two. We talked about now all four, Rhine patinas, metal oxalate, desert varnish, artisanal. The first two are actually destroying the stone. Uh, different types of weathering's going on. Some's uh, chemical and bio-assisted. Some's just bio-assisted. Uh, whereas the artisanal is just uh, applying the material to the surface. Time scales geological, ranging for greater than 50 million years to one to two years. Silicate stones are typically found covered with a rind. Your chemical reactions between the stone minerals, water, oxygen, and or carbon dioxide and water is what how rinds are formed. Your rind patina colors are really due to mixtures and layers of different iron and aluminum uh, oxides, hydroxides, and carbonates. Rinds grow very slowly, and eventually they're going to transform the rock to soil. Again, this is on the geological time scale of 50,000 years. Stone minerals forming metal carbonate rind patinas do help regulate carbons. Earth's carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. It's part of the plants, ocean, and rock equation that keeps planet Earth livable for, for us. As I said uh, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, here's a list of some uh, references that uh, you might find interesting. They, if you haven't seen it already, there's Patina Science Part 1. Uh, that's YouTube. Um, I don't know how well these will translate over um, to the YouTube, if you'll be able to click on, you know, just uh, point or click on them and get the actual uh, article. If it doesn't work, you can always send Tom myself or Sue, an email note, and uh, we'll be happy to send you the slide. This slide actually has the links in there. And so with that, I'm going to turn the show back over to Tom. <laughs>